Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Beata Nickel. I'm historian and at the ICC, I'm deputy head of the Research Institute of European Heritage. And I have the pleasure to chair this very panel called uh, Climate Catastrophe. This is the last of uh, this year editions, uh, edition of the forum uh, panels to start about. We will continue tomorrow. Uh, today we have four speakers. Coincidentally, these are all uh, ladies, uh, three uh, from Poland, one from Slovakia. Uh, I do hope this very important issue, the consequences of which we are already suffering quite uh, visibly, uh, will be uh, interesting for all of you. So uh, let me introduce, uh, before I introduce my, uh, our first uh, panelist, uh, let me remind you that you can use chat for questions and comments and uh, our speakers will eagerly uh, answer them at the end of this uh, session. So uh, before I uh, give the floor to our first speaker who is uh, uh, Ms. Paula Chmielowska, I would like to introduce her briefly. Uh, so uh, she, uh, as I uh, understood well, she represents currently University of Gdańsk. She holds two master's degrees uh, in law and archaeology. And she is also inspector for monuments protection uh, uh, for uh, archaeological mon monuments uh, uh, within the Voivodeship office uh, in Gdańsk. Uh, she will be uh, uh, presenting uh, the um, subject titled Heritage and Green are her tourism in Poland and Scandinavia. Uh, so, uh, Mrs. Paula, uh, the floor is yours. action oh you hear me okay that's great uh today i wanted to speak about the the heritage and the green uh, archaeotourism in poland and scandinavia and the usage of the reconstruction of different archaeological sites uh, and uh, the differences in mindset between the poland and scandinavia that is I'm clicking to change the the not oh okay now it changed. Uh, the great professor uh, Kobolinski, together with Vysotsky, they said that the existence of the archaeological monuments is usually very poorly realized and is revealed only occasionally when contemplating museum display cases or reading press reports about spectacular discoveries of valuable or extraordinary monuments of the earliest past. And I totally agree with them because very often we are not aware of what amazing heritage archaeological uh, sites we have near us. We know of the extremely well-known places uh, such as Egypt or oh, it's not changing again. My presentation. I'm so sorry for the technical problems. I'm not sure why it's not working. Okay, um, we can we know that there are archaeological sites like the Great Pyramids in Egypt or the uh, temples, pantheons, colosseums in Rome or Greece, but we basically have absolutely no idea what is happening around us. Uh, we we can pass every day something and we don't know what is it and what importance it has for us. And the thing is that. I hope it will work this time. I don't know why, but the clicker is not working.
I'm trying to change the presentation for the next slide, but it's not working. Oh, okay, please. I will tell when I want the next slide. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I will quickly just speak about the two different uh, acts, legal acts. Uh, the first one is the European Convention on the Protection of the Archaeological uh, Heritage. And I quickly want to speak about this because it tells us what the archaeological heritage actually is. So it can be any type of structures, any type of construction, any type of group of building, developed sites, movable objects, monuments, uh, anything that is in a context and is on the land or either underwater. And this uh, convention also says that each party uh, shall ensure the opening of those archaeological sites. And this is a huge problem for the archaeologists, especially in Poland, that we do not ensure that the archaeological sites are open to the public. Uh, it's completely different matter in the Scandinavian countries. They are very well aware of the heritage, which I will show you later on. Uh, but they they do not have to even tell the archaeologists or the investors to somehow uh, encourage people to take part and to get into the archaeological sites. In Poland, it's uh, it's very much of a problem, and they need to be really encouraged to show anything because the archaeologists very often are putting gates around the archaeological uh, sites, which I'm telling from my own experience as archaeologist. Uh, can I please ask for the next slide? Thank you very much. Uh, the second uh, act is the Charter for the Protection and Management of the Archaeological Heritage, known as the Lausanne Card. This card is very important because it gives us the basis for the reconstruction of the archaeological uh, sites. It says that uh, the reconstructions should serve two functions, the experimental research and the interpretation. And basically this card allows us to make the reconstruction. Uh, however, we need to be aware uh, that they need to be carried out with the great caution. We need to uh, avoid disturbing any uh, surviving archeological evidence. Uh, and where it's possible, the reconstructions should not be built immediately on the archaeological remains and on the actual remains, and they should always be identifiable as such. This is a huge problem, which I will uh, show you also in a second, because uh, in Poland specifically, but also in Egypt and Greece, Rome, and very well-known uh, archaeological sites, the reconstructions themselves are uh, not named as the reconstructions. We know that there is a stronghold, but we don't have a name, the reconstructions of the stronghold. Uh, can I please ask for the next slide? It is all connected with the cultural tourism. And to quickly uh, give you the definition of the cultural tourism, it is a travel to places with protection while displaying different objects. So basically it means that, for example, uh, some type of park or um, planetarium is in the local plan or it's uh, protected by the European Convention or by the State Act, uh, any type of legal issue that is somehow protecting uh, the uh, site. And from this uh, came the archaeological tourism, the archaeotourism, which is exactly the same. It's just focused on both traveling to the archaeological site and seeing this site uh, together with the archaeology and history. Can I please get another slide? Thank you. Uh, the United Nations created the definition of the sustainable tourism. That I just really quickly want to uh, mention uh, because more and more we are aware that the tourism to different places should be uh, sustainable especially the youngest uh, genera generations, they, they really pushed forward the, uh, the, the legal acts and statutes to, to get the, the tourism to be sustainable. It, it has to take the account, the, the future and the current economy, the social and environmental situation, and it has to respond not only to the, to the state needs, but also to the business uh, needs on the local level. Can I please get the next slide? Thank you. Uh, the green and blue tourism, the green tourism, which is obviously around land, and the blue tourism, which is uh, about the water tourism, uh, it's all about the circular tourism. 
So basically, you start with this offer that is sustainable for uh, going to the archaeological site because the circle tourism is also about the circle archaeotourism. So the agency, archaeologists, the local government is creating the uh, green sustainable offer. Then later on, the selection and planning uh, is going through the uh, sustainable process. You choose a sustainable transport to the archaeological site, like an electric car or a bike. You later on stay in the local places, preferably managed also by the locals. So you choose the sustainable stay and then you get the feedback between the tourists and the professionals. And then, then we have a closed circle uh, that is creating a circle tourism. May I please get the next slide? I just quickly want to speak about the European Green Deal, uh, just very briefly, because I know that probably most of you are not in law uh, regulations. But the European Green Deal made possible the sustainable tourism and the sustainable archaeotourism possible uh, to preserve and restore the ecosystem and biodiversity, create this healthy, fair environment, friendly food system, and is also making sure that you get the sustainable and smart uh, mobility. Can you get the next slide, please? And getting strictly into the topic of my presentation, without any further legal regulations. Uh, I wanted to speak about the Archaeobot project, which I am very proud to be an archaeologist on. Uh, and I have been working for this project for a couple of years now. Uh, this project is uh, ensuring that the green tourism, the green archaeotourism is really into this project, that the uh, archaeologists are really showing their heritage and are really cooperating with the local people. From this project, I will only speak about the two uh, uh, archaeological sites out of five, because there is the Sortemult on Bornholm, Upakra in Sweden, uh, Grudziskovo Widzu, which is a Polish uh, archaeological site together with Twierdzewis Wurstia, also Polish, and then Smoringa, which is also on Bornholm uh, Island. Uh, but I will only speak about two, and you will see in a second why. Can I please get the next slide? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to quickly speak about the reconstruction of the stronghold in Ovid. Uh, more and more, we, we, especially in Poland lately, we get this feeling that the heritage and showing of the heritage needs to be somehow connected with uh, entertainment. And in 2010, the investors together with the local governments, they uh, came up with the idea, with this initiative, that they want to create the reconstruction of the stronghold in Ovid. Uh, just to give you the very basic information about this archaeological site, uh, uh, this site is dated back to 9th century. Uh, most of the uh, site is probably around 10th and 11th century. Uh, and it has been basically researched for a couple of decades, at least from the 70s. However, we know still very little about this stronghold, really little, trust me. Every year I'm digging there and we still know very little. So how the reconstruction was basically made? Um, that's very difficult to say. They basically got our information from all over the place, uh, different areas, different type of reconstructions of the stronghold. And they decided that they, they envisioned that they want to make 10 Slavic houses, um, the gate tower, which is in front of, uh, you can't necessarily see it uh, in a picture. Uh, there is also the guard tower, which you can see in a picture, it's in the left top corner. Mm, the palisade, you can see it behind the, the houses, the wooden palisade and the earth wall uh, palisade, which is kind of behind the wooden palisade. However, they made tons of mistakes creating this reconstruction. Uh, they, they basically uh, destroyed the cultural layer creating this. To build it, they had to get deep into one meter below, uh, into the ground. And that basically made that all of the objects, uh, objects in archaeology, 
uh, in these situations could be the fire pits, uh, different type of pits. They found tones of pottery, uh, tones of uh, bones, not necessarily the human bones because this is not the cemetery, mainly the animal bones uh, that were from the fire pits. Uh, and all of this were completely destroyed during creation of this reconstruction. They also didn't use the original materials that could be used. Uh, they changed completely the type of houses instead of creating the log houses, uh, the, dug ho the dugout houses, they created the log houses. The dugout houses uh, basically means that they should be uh, digged into the ground deeply, quite deeply, like one meter into the ground. These houses are basically 20 centimeters into the ground. And as you can see from the picture, they are squared. Um, uh, and th the sizes of them are completely out of cosmos. There is no scientific research that the houses were squared and they were looking at the houses that are looking uh, right now. However, even though I'm completely not agreeing with this reconstruction, uh, and according to the Lausanne card, I think it should not be made because the Lausanne court basically said that it should not be built immediately uh, on the archaeological side and it should not be destroyed in such matter. However, I think that it has a huge amount of, of pluses. I, I see that I can uh, change the presentation by myself, but can I please still ask for help? Thank you. <laughs> The Archaeobook project is using the uh, social media. Uh, this is something that is strangely unusual archaeologist uh, to encourage the green and blue archaeotourism. But the Archaeobook project is communicated with the local people, with, and with basically everyone who wants to follow the, the social medias. And we are showing every day, day to day, what we are doing, what we are digging, how it looks like. We basically really rely on social media because this is where we can truly communicate and invite people to see what their heritage is. And we also always advise them how to get to us. Not only like we say, hey, use a bike, but we also try to encourage them to be more ecological, to use sustainable different methods uh, in their lives. Can I please get another slide? Uh, the Archaeobook project is also co-hosting uh, the festivals. Those type of festivals uh, are all about the educational purposes, the, the musical lessons, the demonstration of weapons, of fights, the old crafts, uh, performances and historical festivals. They all have uh, one theme. So there can be a theme of like, for example, the medieval herbs or the other theme can be uh, about the medieval crafts. As you can see from the pictures, um, which are uh, main pictures taken at the stronghold in Ovid, uh, mainly those festivals are for kids, but let's not pretend parents and adults, they also have lots of fun uh, doing it and they really, really enjoy it. Can I please get another slide? Thank you. We also have the open days and the workshops uh, where basically kids can do exactly the same thing uh, as an archaeologist, but, uh, but in a safe environment and according to the law. Can I get another slide? Uh, this is something that uh, is used a lot by us archaeologists. So basically, we try to use, if we have the reconstruction and those houses, we really want to use it and incorporate in our uh, trying to popularize uh, the science. So we use those houses to invite people and speak about the heritage that they have around them. Um, can I get another slide, please? We also uh, cooperate with the local schools. So we have tons of school trips uh, that are always coming. And besides the fact that they always think that the archeologists are uh, basically digging the dinosaurs, not necessarily what we are doing in reality. Uh, they are always really proud and surprised that they have school just around the corner and they had absolutely no idea that they had such an amazing huge stronghold however very often they are not aware that those houses are the reconstructions and we have to tell them this is not the real house that the, they were living in this is just the reconstruction 
Can I please get another slide? And this is when I want to speak about the second uh, excavation site from the Archaeobot project, which is the Sorta Mold at Bornholm Island, uh, because it's completely different. Nobody would allow on this island to create any type of reconstructions. And the Sorta Mold is extremely interesting archaeological site because there is uh, this amazing temple. There are lots of um, small gold uh, metal pieces. So it's extremely interesting. Uh, for the for everyone, uh, but no one would allow to create the reconstruction. So they decided to use the tourism, the archaeo tourism, completely differently, and they started with volunteers. This is something that is absolutely not working in Poland. Uh, can I please get another slide? Thank you. Uh, this is the museum right next to the site. This is kind of uh, very interesting. Not something that is working in Poland yet. Instead of reconstruction, they decided to show off what they found in type of the museum. This is a small container, uh, probably 10 meter long, a couple of meter uh, wide. Um, but they put it the most interesting artifacts uh, on the display so that everyone can really see it and touch it. In Scandinavia, people can take the active part in archaeological excavations. They can also dig with the archaeologist. Uh, they they really work with them. They are encouraged to take part uh, in the entire process. And can I please get another slide? Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm finishing. I promise you. I will. I also wanted to just quickly mention that the archaeological project is all about creating the bike rides by which you can get to the excavation side, the board games, and the VR. Uh, the next slide, please. Here you can see the statistics. These are the statistics from 2019 from the Born Home uh, Sorta Mold uh, archaeological site. As you can see, on week three, we had 697 visitors in, uh, in one week, which is absolutely incredible. And the next slide. And here you can see that there are people from all over different countries and, and different cities. And just to quickly summarize the, the entire thing, I wanted to quickly tell that even though I'm not for the reconstructions, you can see that there are different type of mindsets in two different uh, countries. The Poland need reconstructions to really encourage people to take part in the archaeological excavations, to know the archaeological heritage. And then there is the Scandinavia that definitely does not need any encouragement from local uh, parties or, or government or archaeologists because they don't need reconstructions. They just need someone who will be uh, willing to, sh to show them the place and they are well uh, willing to take a bike, ride hundreds of kilometers on this bike to just see this, uh, this side and, and take part. Uh, can I get another slide? And I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone for making possible for me to just show this project and speak about the reconstructions of the, of the archaeological sites and the archaeotourism. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Paula, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, while listening to it, I do understand why I became just an ordinary historian, because being archaeologist, it requires a lot of imagination. And I think uh, this lack of imagination is also uh, the reason of uh, the popularity of reconstructions in Poland. Uh, it's becoming, it's became a kind of uh, uh, national sport uh, everywhere we have reconstructions and it's a good question how to use them and uh, put uh, heritage places especially such a difficult one to be uh, exploited as uh, archaeological sites and uh, I do think this uh, uh, idea of volunteer uh, as a participation uh, in uh, excavations is something really uh, quite interesting. I hope there will be some questions uh, addressed to you at the end of our session. So once again, thank you. And uh, I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Anna Duda uh, from Krakow. 
she uh, holds uh, master degrees in international cultural studies as well as cultural management. Uh, two years ago, she completed her PhD thesis at Wyagilonia University, uh, which was dedicated to Polish uh, tourists exploring the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And uh, the title of her today's speech is uh, Second Life of the Cities After the Nuclear Accidents, the Abandoned Heritage of Chernobyl and Fukushima Exclusion Zones. Uh, so please, uh, Dr. Duda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Oh, I know. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for introducing me. And uh, today I would like to um, tell you something about Chernobyl uh, exclusion zone and Fukushima exclusion zone. And um, I will try to start uh, my presentation. Okay, so it's okay. So I will start. Uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zones are among the darkest places on earth uh, in the public uh, consciousness, uh, abandoned by their inhabitants and contaminated by uh, radiation. Their slow return to life has been observed over recent years. Many of these changes have been influenced by the emergence of tourism. The aim of the uh, paper is to identify uh, common points uh, and differences uh, in the perception of key stakeholders in tourism between the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine and the Fukushima exclusion zone in Japan. With particular emphasis on the process of tourism development in these uh, areas. It's also worth exploring whether the changes that have been taking place under the influence of tourism in the Chernobyl exclusion zone have been affecting the planning and actions for tourism development that have been taken in the Fukushima exclusion zone. The acts of solidarity confirmed between these two countries, triggered by the nuclear accidents they suffered, are also worthwhile to examine. For example, both the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone and the Chernobyl National Museum have places of remembrance and references, uh, not only to Fukushima catastrophe of uh, 11 March uh, 2011, but also to the 1945 atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by Americans. In my presentation, I will address the following uh, issues. Uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zones, a scientific overview, dark tourism according to Philip Stone, darkest liest um, zones, comparative analysis Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zone on Philip Stone's darkest liest uh, spectrum. There have been attempts to compare Chernobyl and Fukushima in recent years. Uh, however, they usually do not focus primarily on the current situation of these places, their return to public space, but as the history, biological effects uh, and power of uh, the explosion are their main topics. The Ukrainian Chernobyl and Japanese Fukushima uh, are today characterized above all by a separate and contaminated space. In tourists' imagination, 
These sites can function as mysterious and exotic places, which are a departure from the norm. Philip Stone, referring to uh, Michael Foucault, um, describes the Chernobyl exclusion zone as a heterotopia when writing, Chernobyl is viewed as a heterotopia, a ritual space that exists outside of time, in which time is not only arrested, but also notions of otherness are consumed in post-apocalyptic place. At the same time, these places are called zero points. This term uh, originally referred to the destructive power of atomic bombs, but with time it also means a return to the beginning, a start from zero. These places became a kind of um, tabula rasa of John Locke, a board which the tribe will re re resemble to write down what has been going on for a few years now, also unnoticed. These spaces are slowly returning to life, to social consciousness and thus to public spaces. Also the reasons for the marking the zero zones were the same between Chernobyl and Fukushima. Main causes of radioactive contamination are completely different be between these two sites. The accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant uh, occurred um, on 26 April 1986. Uh, the human factor was at, fault, was at fault here. The explosion of reactor number four was the result of an experiment that could have been prevented if had not been for the pressure from the Soviet authorities. Researchers uh, assume that the fear of an invisible enemy in the form of a radioactive cloud uh, that surrounded the whole world in the following months was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Over the following years, until 2011, only a small number of people had access to the exclusion zone. From the moment of the catastrophe until today, the towns and villages located within the zone have been subject to a process of naturalization and ruin. The immediate cause of the failure of Fukushima nuclear power plant number one in Japan was the tsunami caused by the earthquake of the northeastern coast of Honshu on 11 March 2011. Since the disaster in the Fuku in Fukushima exclusion zone, intensive decontamination works have been underway to bring back its inhabitants to the currently abandoned areas. This situation has never happened in the case of Pripyat. The current spectral city near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, even 35 years have passed since the disaster. Such differences in the policies and approaches between the Ukrainian and Japanese authorities in relation to these two exclusion zones mean that the attempts to bring these areas back to life commence at about the same time. Despite the fact that these two disasters are 25 years apart, paradoxically, the official beginnings of tourism in the zone date back to 2011, when the state agency for the Chernobyl exclusion zone began to issue permits for organized groups to enter the zone. The Chernobyl frozen for decades and the accelerated the contamination works in the Fukushima exclusion zone since 2011 Allow to look at these two places in terms of tourism development simultaneously in a comparative manner. Dark tourism is one of the branches of cultural tourism arouses numerous controversies. Okay. This range from the perception of places of tragedy to the behavior of tourists in a situation of direct confrontation with the post-disaster space. The biggest problem, however, is created by a wide spectrum of dark attractions and researchers continue to ask the question, is it correct to categorize visits to Nazi, for example, Nazi death camps and modern museums that merely allude to that? The division into so-called darker and less dark attractions was made by the English researchers, uh, researcher Philip Stone, who proposed an index of places to write, taking into account variables um, as we see at presentation. 
Analyzing the variables presented in the figure, uh, one can notice um, a certain relation. The more politi politicized the space uh, is and refers to a still vivid past evoking negative emotions, the place will be situated on the darker side of stone index. Most often these are authentic places focused on commemorating the victims of a um, catastrophe in, and protecting a sacred space. On the right side, um, on the right side of the indicator, on the other hand, there are places whose narrative also uh, oscillates around the theme of death, but the space is inauthentic, commercialized, uh, and without much emotional charge, charge uh, among uh, visitors. While there is no doubt about the darkest and brightest places, there is a noticeable problem with the functionality of the indicator in the case of spaces where cultural dissonance appears. These places fall within the framework of uh, the so-called difficult heritage or dissonant heritage, where dissonance is an inherent feature uh, of heritage so that each person managing it can expect that some aspects of the interpretation uh, of the past will sooner or later um, case to resonate uh, with another. I will now try to do a brief analysis in terms of the Phillips Stone Index, uh, which will illustrate the differences in the growth of post-catastrophe tourism in Chernobyl, Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Okay. First, political influence and ideology. In Chernobyl, the Soviet authorities conciliate the truth about the accident at the nuclear power plant for a long time. Obedience to Homo Sovieticus means that a safety test was carried out despite indications to the contrary. In Fukushima, TEPCO never took responsibility for the nuclear plant accident claiming that no one could have predicted the 14 meter tsunami. However, while important decisions were being made, many things remained, remained unclear, resulting in the Japanese public's aversion to nuclear power plants. Janina Hajduk-Niakowska writes, we are simply culturally determined, programmed for the way we receive, create information related to the nuclear power plant disaster. Because the disaster that took place in Chernobyl on 26 April 1986 determined all subsequent social behavior co copying those first reactions, resulting especially from the dominant role of direct communication in the total absence of reliable information about the events that took place. I try to take the next, okay. And um, education entertainment. Uh, the Chernobyl exclusion zone contains both educational and entertainment elements. Educational because it's the duty of every travel agency organizing trips to the zone to provide a guide who make the tourists aware of the enormity of the tragedy which took place over 30 years ago. The entertainment element in turn results from the tourists uh, inclusion from the tourist interests. These are not only computer games, uh, the action uh, of which takes place in Chernobyl exclusion zone like Stalker of Call of Duty, but also a lively interest in urban exploration or a desire to take romantic horror and mystery photographs in the ruins of Pripyat buildings. In Japan, we deal with Fukushima hope tourism. Tourists not only visit, but by taking to survivors, they have a therapeutic effect on them. Moreover, Fukushima is called the Hiroshima of tourism. Here is linked to the slogans of peace and solidarity, which the narrative of the Hiroshima memorial is framed. Excursion to, excursions to 
areas outside them 20 kilometers zone that were also affected by the disaster take place under the motto support through travel. The excursions are dedicated to various forms of assistance uh, for the revitalization of Tohoku. The two approximately four hour trips to the 20 kilometer zone are quite different. Both are car carried out by non-profit organization uh, Fuyodo at 20, 2100 and Nomado. Basically, the organization aimed to promote the re revitalization of the region by minimizing concerns about the trade uh, in products from Fukushima Prefecture. It takes care of food safety by testing um, for radioactive contamination. Initially, the tours were free of charge. As popularity grew, the organizers bega began to make money from the trips. And history-centric and heritage-centric, the Chernobyl exclusion zone um, harks back to past events, and the commemorative function is strongly emphasized by the memorials to the victims of the disaster. Nevertheless, the zone provokes many questions about how this place will look in the future. With um, solar power plants be built here, uh, is the right place for renewable energy sources. Um, Fukushima tourism, despite being called hope tourism, which is supposed to orientate towards the future, focuses on the history of the disaster and the survivors, survivors who are still uh, traumatized by the uh, events of March uh, 2011. And uh, next. There is some kind of, oh, okay. Authentic, in inauthentic product interpretation and location authenticity. In the case of Chernobyl exclusion zone, one can certainly speak of the authenticity of the place. However, there is a problem with the interpretation of the space. While the buildings in Pripyat are uninhabited, no one managed them, cares for them as a living monument. The spaces inside the building are again changing. The dolls on their heads are wearing gas masks uh, and in some rooms you can see masks um, unnaturally scattered on the ground or around it, uh, arranged objects. In reality these are special reenactments uh, taken for photographs by photographs who do not clean up after themselves but leave the space as it's for subsequent tourists to see. In Fukushima, there is a great respect for the places abandoned by their inhabitants. The building has not, um, as in the case of Pripyat, been look looted. Everything looks as when it was evacuated. This is therefore a kind of um, deviation, because in the Western world, so-called staging at abandoned sites is part and um, parcel of folklore, as one tourist said. Um, this is a fundamental difference from the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And In the case of Chernobyl exclusion zone, one can see a clear strategy for moving around the zone prepared with tourism in mind. In June 2019, President Volodymyr Zelensky aimed at developing a strategy for tourism development in the zone. Um, the decree started a lively discussion on the development of a new tourism roads and special training for guides. Um, in Fukushima, there are very many um, restrictions on entering the zone, despite the tourism promotion, because undoubtedly tourists are an opportunity for the region and the return of its inhabitants who often live uh, in barracks to normality, Japanese Fukushima is focused on the contamination rather than uh, the development of tourism infrastructure. And to summarizing, um, the above analysis carried out with the stone index and the attempt to illustrate it. 
did not meet the original assumption of a Stone's concept. Um, the index, however, proved to be an effective tool uh, in depict depicting the emerging dissonance of places marked by trauma. Even in the uh, data was plotted um, uh, intuitively. Undoubtedly, the analysis of the space of difficult heritage uh, in terms of the cat categories proposed by Stone can be a um, starting point to further uh, qualitative research. Um, despite the uh, difference, differences, um, it's worth noting that representatives of both zones, Chernobyl and Japan, are exchanging uh, experience on the contamination. In Japan, more and more voices are being raised in favor of uh, following the Chernobyl path in terms of tourism development. Among other things, um, there are proposals to turn the Fukushima one nuclear power plant into a tourism resort planned for the period up to uh, 2036. However, uh, this remains um, a continuous issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Duda, thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation showing us differences in use and interpretation of uh, both uh, exclusion zones. Uh, yes, it was really interesting to see your, uh, all those uh, diagrams uh, showing the difference between darkest and lightest uh, uh, depending from the, let's say, engagement, political engagement uh, in the issue. Uh, however, Chernobyl uh, has one advantage in the telling of a story uh, of the catastrophe, uh, namely it's a Nobel Prize winner, Svetlana Alexievich, and her breathtaking accounts based on uh, interviews with uh, victims and, and witnesses of the catastrophe. If there are any questions uh, to you, I hope we can answer them at the end of uh, the session. Uh, so now I would like to ask our third uh, guest uh, uh, in this session, uh, uh, namely uh, um, excuse me, I'm lost a bit. Uh, Dr. Renata Stachańczyk, uh, who will uh, move us from this uh, obviously dark uh, experience uh, to a kind of uh, fairy tale landscape, uh, because uh, she is going to introduce us to the historical gardens reality. Uh, first, let me introduce her. She is a landscape architect and uh, specialist uh, in conservation of historic gardens. Uh, she uh, has a PhD degree from the Krakow University of Technology uh, and she is chief specialist in National Institute of uh, Cultural Heritage. Uh, leads a team for landscape and historical garden areas. And what's uh, of importance in the context of her presentation, uh, since uh, early 90s, she's associated with the restoration project uh, of the Polish part of uh, Muzakowski or Muskauer Park, uh, which uh, is uh, the biggest uh, part such a site in this part of Europe. Good afternoon.
Thank you very much for introducing uh, me. I would like to uh, talk about garden conservation in the context of uh, climate change. Gardens are, are specific uh, creations, uh, impermanent and fragile, not only because on their uh, dominant material it is the vegetation. They are inscribed in the natural environment in which they are established. Uh, they draw on its quality, but they are also dependent on, uh, on it. On the one half, uh, hand, uh, we have aesthetic gains. Uh, for example, a beautiful uh, location, varied topography, abundance of uh, water resources or uh, local uh, flora, etc. Uh, it means everything offered by nature as uh, noted by theoreticians of all epochs. On the other hand, uh, the decision on a particular location linked the garden to specific environmental conditions characteristic to the local situation. The environment can have enormous potential, but it can also activate uh, destructive forces in various uh, circumstances and uh, depends on an, uh, environmental factors, especially in time of climate change, can have various consequences. Uh, the park uh, Murakowski, uh, Muskauer Park, is an exceptional example of using the, uh, the advantages of a location and the qualities of the environment, uh, which was the basic asset of the place. However, uh, you will hear about some of the consequences of such a uh, location. The phenomena associated with negative environmental influences are not new. Uh, man has been struggling with floods uh, since the dawn of time. The chronicle of Jan Długosz uh, records uh, the first flood in 988 when numerous uh, and prolonged floods occurred. They occurred with varying uh, intensity uh, in different uh, areas of the Polish lands and are uh, evidenced by flood plaques. Uh, for example, oops. for example, uh, in June 1884, uh, Warszawa was hit by one of the worst floods in history. In Vilanov residence, uh, the water reached the palace, even though it is located much higher than the garden in the flat plain. In Krakow, uh, Vistula has flooded the city many times. The extent of uh, the catastrophic floods has been commemorated with plaques and 17 uh, plaques have su uh, survived to this day. Not all of the plaques, uh, however, have survived to the present day. In Puave, in the former residence uh, of uh, they were located in the now non-existent uh, Hermes house, a building uh, located in the lower garden at the foot of the escarpment. On its front wall, uh, there were symbols commemorating the floods of uh, 1800, 1813, 37, uh, 39 and uh, 1844. Uh, Today, the plaques are of great factual importance and are usually uh, placed on, the, uh, on an um, actual architectural object, rarely in the garden or uh, park. Probably not uh, only for practical reasons, as uh, if the negative impact of this phenom phenomena uh, on the garden uh, in general was not noticed. And Vilanov is an um, exception here, probably. Is, this seems justified um, because the losses caused by floods as, uh, are first and foremost the losses of human life, homes, property, etc., spheres of greater uh, importance in general uh, opinion. 
Also hurricanes and tornadoes, hail with huge balls uh, of ice are not new phenomena. Such an uh, event was also recorded in Villanov in the second half of the 17th uh, century. Despite numerous studies uh, on uh, violent phenomena, sources on the destruction of parks and gardens are very scattered and can be found only in archives relating to individual uh, sites. People interested in floods, uh, losses in gardens uh, for the first time in the late 1990s in connection with the flood of the millennium, millennium in Lower Silesia. Among more than uh, 300 uh, monuments, uh, many parks were affected at the time. The Ministry of Culture organized a survey of the area and an inventory of uh, losses. As a result of monitoring the situation, this time caused by the hurricane that hit northern, north uh, western uh, Poland in uh, 2017, it was found that more than 100 parks were affected. Um, the issue of material aid, aid uh, for the victims was then considered also for the first time with the National uh, Fund uh, for um, Environmental Protection and Water Management eventually joining uh, in. It is well uh, known from scientific and popular uh, science literature from different media that the last two decades have seen uh, adverse uh, trends in climate uh, change. It all points to global uh, warming and an increase in hydrometeorological extreme phenomena. One group's, um, group of effects uh, includes violent ph phenomena like water surges, flooding, hurricanes and tornadoes. The other, desertification, uh, drying up of reservoirs and, and water courses as here in Verlitz. Appearance of pests, uh, dying uh, of tree stands. These trends can be global in nature or uh, the result of phenomena arising uh, at the national, uh, regional or local uh, level. It is difficult to protect oneself, protect oneself against violent uh, phenomena. They al always cause greater or lesser losses in the garden or par and parks affecting all compositional elements. It has trees, surface, surfaces, ground, infrastructure, uh, small architecture and equipment. Architectural objects are saved in the first place, of course, as well as any valuable park equip uh, equipment, but not the terrain in itself and not the trees, as this is generally not possible. In general, all activities uh, can only be started after the element, be it water or wind, has uh, ceased. I would like to show a few examples. The Park Muzakowski, Muskauer Park. Hurricane Cyril in January uh, 2007 damaged more than 200 trees. The damage seemed extensive, but once the park had been uh, cleaned up, uh, it turned out that the situation was not so dramatic. Many trees, even damaged ones, uh, uh, could be survived. Uh, they were uh, uh, still uh, living. And over time, um, some sprouted or could be preserved in the form of a standing trunk. The same uh, area was flooded in uh, 2010 uh, by the surging waters of the Lusatian Nice. The park interiors and the floodplain terrace were flooded over a length of about 2.5 kilometers. The road surface was destroyed. 
potholes um, were formed, uh, the surface was washed away and displaced. All trees uh, growing on the river bank were knocked down. The river carried silt uh, with a layer exceeding 20 to 30 centimeters in places, as well as solid debris. In addition, um, there were heavy rains uh, that damaged roads and soil in uh, areas located higher. But <clears throat> the biggest problem uh, was the breaking uh, of the river bank at the central point of the park, which was getting worse as the level of the river rose and over time reached a length of about 100 uh, meters. The loss of the land uh, area amounted to about uh, 10 acres and covered a large section of the main road. After the water receded, a damaged inventory and an initial cleanup were carried out, um, followed by a compensation uh, for uh, losses. Repairing the bank took the longest, over a year. However, due to the status of the site, because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and um, a historical monument, both uh, the funding and the implementation uh, of uh, work, work uh, were prior, uh, priority And the next, um, next example, Ruba Strong. A uh, hurricane pass, uh, uh, passed uh, uh, through the historical uh, residence, uh, causing enormous uh, damage. Among the mangled, uh, broken and oven torn uh, trees, it was uh, difficult to recognize the earlier scenery. Despite the fact that the park had a newly uh, made an inventory and documentation prepared uh, by the employees of the National Institute of um, Cultural Heritage, uh, because it is under our care, it was not uh, easy to uh, determine the scale of uh, losses. Due to the destruction, the handling of some elements had to be reconsidered. This is particularly true of the Airstrew Avenue, Avenue which was eventually uh, planted uh, while leaving the relic uh, trees. This site also contributed uh, to our recommendations for dealing with this type of damage, uh, which were passed on by the General uh, Monument Inspector to the Voivod's Chief Heritage Protection Officers last year. These recommendations emphasized the role of documenting both uh, the losses and the monument itself. As such material it provides the opportunity and basis for uh, reconstructing the uh, composition. And one example more. Białatów was destroyed by a tornado in July uh, 2011. Professor Małgorzata Milecka, when describing the situation, said that the destruction uh, had in irretrievably deprived uh, this uh, residence of a beautiful setting provided by the major tree stand, and that the entire park had been stripped of its uh, legible composition. The damage was dramatic and affected 95% of the total st uh, tree stand. The situation was worsened by the fact that the property, which had been neglected anyway, uh, lost its user shortly afterwards. This example uh, shows uh, the importance uh, of appropriate uh, administra uh, administrative uh, support, uh, also content related uh, and financial uh, support. In this case, many mistakes were made although uh, perhaps the situation is uh, not hopeless. And uh, what um, 
if the destroyed garden or, or park has no documentation and moreover no uh, surviving uh, architectural elements. Although, uh, according to doctrine, uh, plant material is considered renovable, in such a situation there is a, simply no uh, possible uh, possibility of uh, recreating anything and the garden ceases uh, to uh, exist. The total um, uh, compensation for adverse climate change is of course not possible, but to some extent we can have influence on it. The right approach uh, to managing conservation processes, ongoing maintenance uh, or planning restoration work can be the key to reducing negative impacts. So what are actions to support sustainable uh, conservation uh, processes? Uh, I would like to uh, present some uh, examples. At first, uh, rational programming of the utility uh, function adjusted to the resources of the site, too many users and overinvestment is destructive uh, for the substance of the uh, garden. Then, a rational program formulation, reflecting, uh, shing, uh, reflection uh, on the desire of complete restoration, uh, reconstruction. I'm showing two examples. Uh, the first, uh, completely, very good, of course, but completely reconstruction. And the another one, only fragmentary reconstruction. The next, um, uh, rational design solution. There are a few possibilities, some ideas. Limiting investment interference in existing systems, not over investing, avoiding invest investment uh, where possible. Uh, in this case, uh, there is a question, was the insulation of foundation actually necessary if the tree itself dries the wall its roots? Caution in interfering uh, with land form and ground changes. In this picture, this picture shows that the level of the ground is visibly higher, which is of course um, very bad for trees. Next, re um, redu reduction of hard surfaces in favor of mineral surfaces. And next, retaining water rather than discharging it outside. And one example more, you can see a beautiful meadow where is a system of dikes which were reconstructed 20 years ago. However, during the drill and after the, uh, 20 years, the meadow dry, dries up uh, and the water shortage is also visible uh, by another uh, water courses in uh, this park. Rational design solution, economical use of modern materials in favor of uh, tradi traditional uh, methods and materials. Uh, in this case, tra the traditional reinforcement uh, of the slope and a pond, pond uh, bank with fazain or tough versus engineering me methods. Use of local or regional conditions for plant material, it has more resistant, resistant in local areas. Preservation of biodiversity in different way. Preservation of habitats for diverse groups, preservation of local uh, species uh, appropriate to the habitat, uh, grassland uh, undergrowth, or activation of old varieties. Changes in management. 
adapting historical models in the handling of gardens, striving to reactivate gardening facilities and utility loads, production of own plant materials, composting plant residues, close matter cycles. And the last, and very important, long-term uh, maintenance operations. So the conclusion, uh, the protection of a garden or park depends to a large extent uh, on proper care, ongoing maintenance and conservation of all its element on a rational and sustainable, if I can say in this way, approach to its use. This is the key and the chance to strengthen its natural resistance and stability and guarantee of preservation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if uh, your recommendation regarding historical gardens couldn't be applied to every single garden in this very country, uh, especially in the respect of, uh, let's say, using local plants and trees. Uh, 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 I do wonder how long we will continue with, uh, yeah, spoiling our landscape with uh, quite uh, strange uh, plants uh, imported from uh, abroad. Uh, last but not least, I would like now to go to our last uh, speaker today, uh, who is Ms. Emilia Szwecowa from Slovakia. Uh, we will continue with Open Our Heritage now. Uh, she's going to uh, introduce us to ecologically sustainable measures in the museum. And the example she's going to use, as uh, I understand, it's uh, the Open Air Museum uh, in Banska Szczyawnica, Slovakia, uh, which deals with mining uh, history. Uh, so she is going to discuss especially the issues uh, of environmental impact uh, on the museum's activities. Uh, so, Mrs. Szpetcowa, the floor, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, the organizers and participants of the 6th Heritage um, and Development Forum we feel honored to present our paper on implementing ecologically sustainable measures in our museum, the first observations and experiences of the Slovak Mining Museum in Banska Štiamica, Slovakia. Author of the paper, Emilia Švecová. Good afternoon. Uh, and my name is Silvia Herianova. I am the translator of the paper to English and the presenter for you today. We both are members of a team in, in the museum, a team with a goal to make the operation of our museum ecologically sustainable. Um, in this paper, we would like to present the functioning of our museum uh, from the viewpoint of the impact of our activities on the environment. Also, we are going to introduce to you our plans 
um, for improvement as well as elimination of the negative impacts of our operation on the environment. Through these few pictures, uh, we are inviting you on a short tour of Banska Štianica, a beautiful medieval UNESCO town. The town was built thanks to um, rich resources of gold and silver. Due to the unique and preserved architectural and historical image of the town uh, center and the valuable mining technical monuments in its vicinity, Banska Štianica was included uh, on the list of UNESCO World Cultural and Natural Heritage List in 1993. The beginnings of the Slovak Mining Museum um, go back to 1900s, when the town's municipal museum was founded um, in the old castle. You can see it in the left, upper left corner of this um, of, the, of the slide. Uh, it was gradually transformed, um, taking under its administration other buildings and premises in town. At the moment, there are seven historical buildings under our administration in Banska Štiavnica and one in the town of Handlova, which is a coal mining town about 70 kilometers away from Banska Štiavnica. In these buildings, we protect and or present um, about 100,000 collection items representing the fields of mining, archaeology, history, ethnology, arts, crafts, and others. Well, and our new goal, since we have a new management of the Slovak Mining Museum, we have a new goal to transform the museum into a green museum. There are several reasons why we see this as important. The seats of museum exhibits are located in historical buildings. Therefore, we have been asking ourselves this question, are they ecological or not? Well, they are not. And then the next question we have been asking ourselves is how to approach the very complex issue of decreasing their energy demands. Also, another the reason why we are doing this is that we are experienced in environmental education. We cooperate with schools within the region and outside of it. Another reason, we wish, we truly wish to be part of those communities that actively address the issues of the ongoing climate crisis. Another thing that in our museum we are facing the issue of the sustainability of materials that were used in part in the past, such as metal, wood or stone, and the newer ones, mainly plastic uh, materials that have begun occurring in our collections. Well, and uh, undoubtedly one of the reasons to build a green museum is our position in public life. We influence public opinion with what we do and how we do it. We are under the direct administration of the Ministry of the Environment, another big reason and, and a really binding fact. The first thing we want to do is to focus on the way museum operates. We need to define our problems, our drawbacks, motivate our employees to change their behavior and then design and implement solutions. So um, we are looking for the way how to come closer to the goal to build the first green museum in Slovakia. Of course, we need a number of tools and measures to achieve this ambitious goal. We need to acquire data analyze them and highlight the most problematic issue of this museum. We have a dedicated internal team and also can rely on expertise of a number of external colleagues. We need to, um, uh, we need to design intelligent measures, monitor their outcomes, assess the results of our work and keep on implementing changes. We are an active group of people, an active museum. We respond and we need to continue doing it, respond to initiatives. 
contribute with our activities in raising the public awareness of environmental issues. We need to inform about our work and challenge the public to join us, so serve as a source of inspiration. And here we are, we are a team of devoted colleagues. Zuzana is the new museum's director and the Green Museum idea is among her priorities. Anna, she is an experienced and um, active environmentalist who is an expert in environmental education in the museum. She has been active in the field for over 20 years. Iveta is a creative and inspirational person in the position of a project manager and marketing expert. Milka has a str strong sense of responsibility for the environment and her task in the museum is to coordinate the measures leading toward making the museum ecologically sustainable, monitor them and assess the outcomes of our work. And then it's me, Sylvia, <laughs> I'm in the position of the museum galleries um, project coordinator and um, have a strong sensitivity to issues such as climate change and its impact on the earth. So I've become very quickly involved in all activities related to building a green museum. Okay, well, the number one issue we want to focus on in, uh, in our museum is waste. Upon the analysis of the waste we produce, we have come to see that the essential part of communal waste still contains elements that could be separated for recycling. We separate all kinds of waste and our goal is to have offices without waste bins. It means to eliminate mixed waste production by teaching our employees to engage in responsible waste separation. But above all, to motivate them to think about waste production and uh, try not to produce waste at all. The fee we pay for waste collection is quite high. It is about 3,500 euro a year. By decreasing the amount of communal waste, we can decrease the annual fee for its collection. At the moment, we are not paying for uh, the collection of separated waste, for we are not considered an entrepreneur entity. A great thing that we have achieved in the last few months is that we have managed to improve our communication with the waste collection company. It was really important because we have been facing complaints by our employees regarding the low frequency of separated waste collection, which resulted, of course, in frustration and lack of will of our employees to separate. Another big issue, heating. Energy consumption costs uh, are about 170,000 euro per year. This is an enormous part of our budget. We operate eight buildings and use a variety of energy resources for heating. Our main problem is a long-term lack of finances that would need to be allocated um, for the renovation of our boiler rooms and the regulation of our heating system. As a result, we have to face energy wasting and bad climatic conditions for our collections. So we have to actively control these conditions by using air humidifiers or air dryers. High energy consumption is also a result of the condition of our buildings. We lack proper insulation and therefore lose energy. Also, we have to deal with the consequences of improper renovation measures that have been implied um, to buildings. So what is it we want to do? Number one, we need to prepare a um, high quality documentation that we need for the renovation of our heating system. Then to conduct energy audit of our buildings. And our great aim is to gradually switch to use of renewable energy resources. Well, another great issue similar to heating is illumination. 
in our exhibits, there is often unregulated day-long il illumination of vast halls. We use outdated lights that do not meet the modern standards of illumin illuminating the exhibited objects. We have managed to equip some exhibits with light saving, uh, uh, lights having motion sensors, and we wish to continue in doing so. We are also actively advocating for a responsible approach to light utilization in our teams. An individual chapter and a big one in our efforts to make our functioning greener is the way we purchase material and surface, uh, services. Despite the fact that we as a state institution are bound by the Slovak government's resolution to purchase goods through green public procurement, the share of such goods was very low last year. It was only 26% of all orders and 16% of the total sum we paid for goods in 2020 that was purchased through GPP. The goal of Slovakia is to have 70% share of green public procurement in all purchases by 2030. The Slovak Mining Museum wishes to be part of the process of increasing the GPP ratio in purchases. The product groups that we are obliged to purchase through GPP are office paper, IT devices, transport and detergents. At the moment, we consider the monitoring of material consumption, mainly office paper, insufficient in our museum. Its consumption, the paper consumption, is quite high. There are bad habits. We have noticed there are bad habits prevalent in our work that need to be changed. We need to work on awareness raising here among our employees. We started to outline the Green Museum concept at the end of 2020. The first step we took in the museum was that we presented the intention to build a Green Museum to our employees, to public and to the ministry that we are, under, we are administered by. Then we designed and adopted our internal guidelines, documents focused on material consumption, general uh, green public procurement, waste management and waste production prevention, decreasing energy consumption and work procedures in the museum's expert work. The documents are of recommendation character, are based on the principles of implementing voluntary environmental tools, contain measures in the field of decreasing negative impacts of museums activities on the environment. Along with informing about the internal guidelines, our employees, information campaigns were launched for our employees that were communicated via emails during the lockdown. Their aim was to motivate toward waste production minimization and responsible use of detergents. Gradually, we are installing elements that help us decrease our energy consumption and contribute to environment protection, such as water savers, motion sensor lights, composters, rainwater collecting containers, etc. Uh, museum was closed for about four months at the beginning of this year, um, so we could not physically implement a, a great part of our initial intention since we work from home. Also, uh, <clears throat> communication with our colleagues was done basically online, but we have captured some of the reactions of our colleagues. They are all very relevant to us. We want to work with them for they give us feedback. We plan to test various forms of communication with our colleagues, be it direct, playful, through training, discussions, etc. We consider the raising the awareness of environmental issues among our employees as an essential part of our efforts to, be, to build a Green Museum. The Green Museum activities are not anything completely new to this institution. Environmental education and other education activities in the museum have a long tradition and we can build on this tradition. In environmental education or through environmental education activities, we cooperate with schools within the region and outside of it. We can really speak about the generational continuity in this case. 
Environmental education in the museum is conducted by internal but also external experts. At the moment, we are working on innovating the, um, these education activities with the goal to make them of even higher quality. We present the principles of responsible approach to the environment at our event, events too. At festivals, there are regional craftsmen selling their products. We act responsible during these um, uh, festivals. We separate waste. We don't use single-use dishes and cutlery to serve food. We use biodegradable dishes or cups for separated, uh, repeated use. We teach how can material be recycled at our creative workshops and also invite promoters of environment-friendly approaches to our events. We annually organize a bazaar. It's a fair of unneeded things. It's a very popular summer event where people bring things that they do not need or want anymore. And we can tell you this is a very, very pleasant event. A lot of old time family associations arise here so there is much more to it than just environment than just the fact that we tackle environmental issues we organize creative workshops where traditional approaches to working with a variety of materials are emphasized Well, uh, we motivate but also model environment friendly behavior we organize or participate in campaigns. We are planning to work on projects of energy consumption reduction, environmental enhancement, building community herbal and rain gardens. You could have, you know, they were seen here, rain gardens, these are plans to build. And all these consisting environmental infrastructure elements such as rainwater capturing elements, composting, etc. And um, just to uh, I would like to add at this, uh, the end of this slide is that we have just become members of the uh, Museums for Future Alliance and have also our Climate Pact Ambassador. And last but not least, but it's a very new thing, the museum has um, contacted the Slovak Institute for Environmental Policy because we wanted to have our museum carbon foot footprint calculated. The indicators that were assessed were energy consumption, fuel consumption, air travels, and possibilities for renovating eight historical buildings. Our carbon footprint in 2021 is 340 tons of CO2. The measures that this institute proposed uh, for us to follow or try to implement is transition to green energy use, use of electromobiles, and gradual renovation of our buildings. If we manage to implement measures, the museum's carbon footprint in 2040 should be 206 tons of CO2, which we could eliminate by planting 188 trees. Thank you very much for your attention and Please keep your fingers crossed that we manage to achieve this big goal, this very ambitious goal of building the first green museum in Slovakia. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And please keep your fingers crossed that we manage to achieve this big goal, this very ambitious goal of building the first green museum. Uh, thank you, certainly we will keep our fingers crossed. Uh, thank you very much for this guideline for good practices and uh, you proved once again that every change we have to start from ourselves. Uh, let me check if there are any questions or comments. Uh, to my surprise there are no questions and no comments. So perhaps uh, any of the speaker would like to add something or comment on, please let me know.
Ah, I see nobody. So, any comments, uh, additional remarks from you? No, if not, then I would like to thank you once again very much and I would like to invite uh, uh, all the participants for tomorrow uh, at 3.30 sharp we start the second part of our session and we will have uh, three speakers more. So thank you very much and wish you a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.